welcome. Thanks for joining us. May the Holy Spirit work in your life as you hear this message. I'll begin with a trial of my own. Long, long ago, long ago, I had a nightmare about a bacon cheeseburger. I think you know by now that I have a few food issues. You might have figured that out. But see, this was the tastiest nightmare I had ever had. I had tried going all in on this vegetarian diet. You know, nothing but, but salads and, and fruit and, and veggie salads and veggie sandwiches and, and more salads. And I lasted like five weeks. I think I also lost some weight. But then I had the nightmare. And I can still picture it in my mind. After all those salads, I, I saw myself, I felt myself, I, I sensed myself floating in the air through the door of Jackson Hole Burgers in Upper West Side Manhattan. I flew past the hostess, over the counter, and then I hovered over the griddle, which was chock full of burgers sizzling to juicy perfection. The aroma made me so hungry, I wanted to eat them all. And then I saw myself sitting at the counter and staring at this giant bacon cheeseburger and a mound of fries sitting on a plate. And then I grasped the burger with both hands and I pulled it close. And then I woke up. <laughs> it, was, it was a nightmare. It was breakfast time on Saturday morning and I swear that if I had ever looked at another fruit salad, it would just go out the window, bowl and all. So I skipped my martial arts class that morning, and I showed up at Jackson Hole as soon as it opened. And 15 minutes later, my life as a vegetarian officially ended. <laughs> now, on the one hand, I felt like a failure because I didn't lose any weight from that point on. In fact, I probably gained back the pounds I lost. But on the other hand, I had just eaten one of the best burgers in the city. Who says temptation can't be tasty? And I know that's a grilled cheese sandwich, but I should have put a bacon cheeseburger up there. In fact, temptation can be the most appetizing of ordeals. Now, I have struggled with weight most of my life. When I was seven... I was rail thin. But then this friend showed me, and I remember this very clearly, how if I snuck the entire cookie jar without my parents knowing about it, well, I could eat more than two. A lot more. My middle school years then became one fat joke after another. And I endured, and even as I endured the daily humiliation, I still never learned what healthy eating looks like. Even four days of martial arts a week could not make up for a bad habit. So as an adult, I went through diet after diet, resolution after resolution, um, discipline after discipline, and just about every time temptation came when I could least resist. Some interruption would come, a business trip, a round of celebrations, a wedding, some stressful period. Something would throw me off my new pattern and send me back to the burgers and cookies. Now, I'm sure some of us might understand what it means to struggle with healthy eating, and, and sometimes our struggles can bring us far more serious consequences than a little teasing. Weight and eating struggles can actually damage our self-image. And 
it can lead to devastating eating habits that can severely harm our health. When I was a student chaplain in a hospital in New York, I met a woman who starved herself to the point where she could barely walk and had to spend weeks in the hospital. And the really sad part about it is she described her practice as a spiritual practice. Now, others may struggle with other things. Spending, drinking, gambling, lust. And others may, may find themselves abandoning their dreams the moment that they meet with naysayers or resistance or conflict. In how many ways can we find ourselves among the Hebrews in the wilderness longing for the bondage of familiar, familiarity? Sometimes we get so comfortable with ourselves in the way things are that we forsake the new life God has in store for us. Committing to a new life, a new way of thinking, a new way of doing things, always comes at a cost. And as we will read in our Bible story in a moment, temptation often comes when we can least resist. But you know what? God is with us every step of our way. And so when the trials and the temptations come, let's live in faith and endure. We're reading through the Gospel according to Luke all winter long, and so please feel free to read along or read ahead. And so far... We really haven't heard Jesus say very much at all. In the first three chapters, his only line of dialogue comes when he is 12 years old. On a trip to Jerusalem, Mary and Joseph uh, head back home, and Jesus hangs at the temple. And when Mary and Joseph realize that he's missing, they rush back to the temple, and they tell him how worried they were. And then Jesus replies like this in Luke 2.49. Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? So now we here have biblical evidence that Jesus was a snarky teenager. (laughs) Fully divine and yet so fully human. Just kidding. Luke reports that Jesus is a good boy after all that. But that's basically all he says. Even at Jesus' baptism, Jesus himself doesn't have any lines. John the Baptist and the voice from heaven do all the talking. So now we come to Jesus engaging in his first full conversation in the gospel according to Luke. And who does he talk to? El Diablo. While Jesus is starving... The devil tries to tempt him away. Let's read the gospel according to Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to be a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. The devil then led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority. For it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, 
He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put your Lord, the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. An opportune time. I love it. I love this. It's like when Judas decides to betray Jesus. Now the Gospels, according to Matthew and Mark, also include this story, but they treat it just a little differently. Mark's version simply says, And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. That's it. Just the bare bones with Mark. And now Matthew orders Satan's questions just a little bit differently, but he also includes the line about the angels waiting on Jesus. So Luke ends this story with the devil exiting stage left and rubbing his hands and saying, (laughs) I'll be back. Luke's ending carries far more suspense, dramatic tension. And, and it reminds us of Simeon's prophecy when Jesus is a baby that Jesus is destined to be a sign that will be opposed. You see, whenever we embark on something new, a new life, a new diet, a new job, a new fitness regimen, a new ministry, Whenever we try to change something in the world, provide better living conditions for those on the margins, seeking seeking equanimity and justice in our society, striving for a more secure, prosperous, and healthy future for the coming generations, well, chances are we are going to meet with, with challenges and with accidents and with opposition and with malevolence and sometimes even violence. Things that are really worth having do not come without a struggle. And we will only attain these things if we persevere. In the early days of Methodism, John Wesley and his fellow preachers often had vegetables and clods of dirt thrown at them whenever they were preaching outdoors. Sometimes it was even rocks. John Wesley reports one striking him in the chest. And Wesley famously reflects that because the Spirit of the Lord was with him, he felt no pain. Sometimes mobs would seize the Methodists. And they would hold them hostage. And they would bully them and try to intimidate them into never coming back. But the Methodists persevered. They persevered until this moment in time when we now have 12 million members of the United Methodist Church globally and counting. How did they do this? How did they persevere through such opposition? Well, they had scripture. And they trusted in God with their whole lives. Let's take it back to our story. Notice how whenever the devil questions Jesus, our Savior answers with, it is written, or it is said. And then each time, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy. But the devil knows Scripture too. In fact, he uses a verse from the 91st Psalm to tempt Jesus into testing God by harming himself. And so Jesus then refers to Scripture to illuminate God's will. As with any power we possess, we can use our Scripture to heal or to harm. To build ourselves up or to tear others down. How we choose to apply our Scripture 
is up to us. But let's remember this point. The general rules of Methodism, as handed to us by our own John Wesley, are to do no harm, to do good, and to attend to the ordinances of God. So if we apply the Bible in a way that harms others, or seeks to elevate ourselves at the expense of others, well, we've gone and violated our own rules. The one basic ordinance of God, if you will, that our Lord and Savior has given us is to love one another as he loves us. And I say this over and over and over again because if we do not get this right, honestly, none of the rest of it really matters. If we do not follow this one basic command in, commandment given to us by Jesus in our scripture, not just in words, but in the things that we say and the things that we do, especially out there. If we don't follow his commandment, can we honestly say we believe in him? The devil will tempt us with our basest desires, approach us in our most profound hunger and need and fear and anger. And the devil will offer us wealth and power and influence and security and glory and every fat-laden, tasty morsel we could possibly imagine. It will satisfy our cravings. But guess what will happen next? In 15 minutes, we'll crave more. And the devil will misuse scripture to our downfall. The devil will offer us the tastiest morsels of life on earth if we will only give up following the ways of God. If we will only break our own rules. If we will only forsake our new and eternal life. So as we embark on something new this year, as we seek to fulfill our resolutions, it could be a career, it could be a, an eating practice, it could be a ministry, it could be fitness. If it, it could be something that God is calling us to do. Let us not veer off course to the new and holy life when our first sign of resistance comes. Let us not give in to our own fears. Let us not give ourselves over to our anger. Let us not seek to lift ourselves up by downplaying others, holding others down. Let us instead press on with our mission to love others as God in Jesus Christ loves us. Let's trust in God and let's trust that God is with us every step of the way, through every trial and every temptation. And when the devil offers us another tasty, appetizing ordeal, when the devil invites us to return back to the same old, same old, let's run to the new life. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, thank you for every blessing that we have in life. Thank you for the breath that you breathe into us. Thank you for every new day. Thank you for this new year. And thank you for the faithful people who are now gathered here today. God, we know that there are things in our lives that need to change. Habits that need to be turned into other habits. Life-giving habits. Healthy habits. We know that something in our spiritual lives needs to change. Just a little bit more prayer, oh God. A little bit more scripture every day. A little bit more sharing our faith 
experience with someone else. And so, God, we pray as this new year progresses that your Holy Spirit will work within us and among us and around us, above us and below us, so that we may live into your new life as fully as we can. God, may your holy word and may your holy presence keep the devil at bay. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share our video. Let's send God's love all over the world. If you find yourself in Jensen Beach, Florida, please join us for worship. Our services are at 9, 15, and 11. And if you'd like to find out more, please visit www.trinityjb.org. See you next time. Blessings.